Well, good evening, everybody. This is a, um, it's very rewarding. You get a, almost a full house, and you only recognize about half a dozen people, so that's great. I'm not speaking to the same, the usual suspects, so that's really nice, too. Um, I did give a little thought today about uh, telling the story maybe a little bit differently, but there's only one story, and there's only so many old pictures. So if you you may have heard some of this before, um, but about halfway through the talk, um, which is going to be about 45 minutes, um, we get to the report card that Bark released uh, in 2017, the fourth um, Queen Queen Quinennial uh, uh, every five years uh, report card, going back to 2002. Um, I want to thank. Uh, the Institute. This is my third invitation to come and give one of these lectures in the last couple of years, and that's uh, a real honor, and I thank you. And um, I think it speaks to the importance of the Bay and its recovery to the, uh, to the community, and, uh, and the issues and, and, and the, the interest that people have in, um, in learning what's going on and possibly getting involved. And I'll have some suggestions for that uh, towards the end. Um, just reminded, while uh, Brent was talking about planning for March, March the 9th, the Friday before the, the March break, Bark is hosting its annual winter uh, friend raiser. Um, we make a, it's a bit of a fundraiser, but it's mostly just to celebrate successes in the RAP, uh, the Remedial Action Plan, the recovery of the harbor, and uh, that's at the Waterfront Center. Um, there's, a, there's a bar, there's live music, there's a little bit of food, and a silent auction with some really nice stuff in it. So those details and a lot of other stuff is at hamiltonharbor.ca, that's our website. You can find it there, and without further ado, let's start at 1796, shall we? So first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, uh, Ontario, was, was uh, John Graves Simcoe and his wife in their travels from Niagara to Kingston and so forth, stopped to paint all kinds of stuff, which is a really great uh, uh, little treasure of, of, of um, illustrations of what life was like uh, 200 and some years ago. She happened one day in, uh, in June of 1796 to be on Burlington Heights, which is between the High Level Bridge and Dundurn Castle. And she painted or sketched a number of illustrations looking out onto Coots and looking out east onto the bay, and this is one of those illustrations. Uh, about uh, 15, a little more years later, uh, an official governmental report, a crown report out of London, said that Burlington Bay was perhaps the, <clears throat> as beautiful and romantic a situation as any in the interior of America, particularly if we include with it a marshy lake which falls into it and a noble promontory that divides them. Burlington Heights, York Boulevard. Let's think about that for a second. In 1813, we had in our bay, in our marsh, perhaps as beautiful and romantic a situation as anywhere in the interior of America. And then we did this. So this is Stelco, uh, an aerial photo of Stelco and its surrounding waters. <coughs> in about the mid-1950s. Uh, you can see that the, that the bay is being infilled, and then of course everything running off land and from pipes and so forth, from industrial and other uh, processes and the waste from those uh, activities, obviously it's making it less than, uh, less than romantic and beautiful. We weren't alone, of course. This is the city of um, Cleveland and the mouth of the Cuyahoga River. And so Hamilton and, uh, and Cleveland and dozens of other places in the Great Lakes in the early 19, sorry, in the late, mid eight to late 1980s were deemed areas of concern. So these aren't places with declining fish populations and, and, uh, and an excess of, of algae, for example, that was happening all over the Great Lakes. These were particularly polluted and contaminated areas that needed special attention. And so the United States and Canada, which in 1972 had signed the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, revised the agreement in the late 80s to include something called remedial action plans. So these are governmental-led plans that involve and uh, uh, stakeholders from the community to agree first on what the problems were, uh, then on what, the, what actions could be taken to restore 
uh, the problem, restore the, the, the uh, quality of the environment and the fish and the wildlife that may have been lost and recreational activities that may have been, um, may have, have to be given up due to loss of habitat, uh, loss of water quality. And then to agree on who was responsible for doing what and assigning responsibilities according to the mandates of different agencies and whatnot. And this happened all across the Great Lakes. Uh, every one of these dots in Ontario and in the Great Lakes states was one of these areas that had steel mills or paper, pulp and paper mills. They were a, a bay that didn't get circulated and had a lot of contamination. It was a connecting channel like a river uh, that had a lot of industry on it, uh, a lot of uh, effects coming off the landscape, say from agriculture or sit growing cities, each one of these had a particular set of problems and got what's called a remedial action plan. So that's in the late mid to late 1980s. But don't think that this is a problem that suddenly occurred in the in the 80s or even in the 70s or even in the 50s when I showed that picture of Stelco earlier. Let's go back to the 1860s. So prior to Confederation in 1862, the Spectator editorialized about conditions in the bay that we have been informed that the refuse from the coal oil refineries, which is emptied into the bay, is having a very deleterious effect upon the fisheries at the beach. It is said that the water on certain mornings is covered for a considerable distance with oil and the effect has been to drive away the fish from the beach. The subject is not without difficulty. This could be an editorial from 2018. In the infancy of the coal oil industry, it would be inexpedient to place restrictions on the operations of refiners, but at the same time, it would be disastrous to the fishing industry if the fish are driven away by the noxious effluvia arising from the coal oil. Now, thankfully, much of that noxious effluvia has been uh, curtailed by, uh, by um, regulation laws and policies and regulations going back into the 1980s. An industry does not have the effect on water quality in the harbor uh, that it once did, not even close. But consider this picture for a minute. This is the Great Western Railway uh, as it was established um, in the late 1850s, early 19, 1860s, excuse me. Um, and think that this is only 60 some years. This is only two three generations from Mrs. Simcoe's paintings. It's only 50 years from that assessment coming out of London, England, and the Crown document calling our bay and our, our marsh, Coots Paradise, uh, uh, beautiful and romantic. And yet, in the 1860s, they're recognizing not only do we have a problem here, but it's across the bay that we're we're creating industries along the south shore and they're having an effect on the beach um, across. So that we're having widespread ecological impacts going back even 150 years. Uh, much of the problem was driven by uh, development, ongoing development, and the encroachment of humans and their activities into the ecosystem. So it's a map from 1921. You can see uh, in the upper up in here. So this is Stelco, uh, International Harvester. This is DeFasco over here. Um, so Stelco, you guys over here. International Harvester, DeFasco is over here. Burlington Street is um, right there. So you can see these long <coughs> coast you guys over here. So here's Burlington Street. You can see these long coastal inlets. Sorry, Burlington Street right there. So the whole south shore of the harbor, if we go back to when Mrs. Simcoe was paint, making that painting, you can't see from her illustration, but some of the most productive coastal wetlands in the entire Great Lakes Basin were here in Hamilton Harbor on the south shore. And we decided to put steel mills in other industry and, and, and build our city on, on top of that by infilling the harbor. This is an illustration, or sorry, I should say uh, an aerial photograph of what that would have looked like as one environment was changed into another. The extent of which, <coughs> over that entire history, uh, is il illustrated by the gray in this in this uh, in this illustration. About 25 percent of the original surface water of the harbor was infilled for a variety of, of purposes. The 
Bayfront Beach is here. Those, the rail yard, that original rail yard is here. Uh, the Williams Coffee Pub is out here. Stelco, DeFasco, uh, Windermere, and the Red Hill Valley is over here. And a lot of the beach strip uh, as well. So one important thing to remember is, you think back to 1862 or 1796, people have always had, as they do with water, a really special relationship. And Hamilton and Burlington, the communities, uh, those communities are no different. Um, this is a photograph, the foot of Bay Street, at the beach that there uh, in the in the 1930s, late 1920s. Um, by this point, the city of Hamilton had already, due to water quality concerns, purchased land across on the North Shore in Burlington. Uh, now we know it as LaSalle Park. They built a beach house there. They were ferrying people in the 1920s uh, over to LaSalle Park to try and find a place that they could safely recreate. And in fact, they had to stop because the water, even on the North Shore, had been contaminated uh, with bacteria and, and, and other contaminants, making it unsafe for swimming. So it's fair to say, if you can't swim safely at LaSalle Park, due to industry largely on the South Shore, we have a uniformly dangerous environment. In fact, a, a city of Hamilton reported in the late 1950s actually referred to it as the world's largest and most beautiful septic tank. Referring, of course, to the fact that most of the toilets flushed in Hamilton in 1958, the, the majority of, the, of that volume of material went unadulterated into the harbor. There was some wastewater treatment um, screening for solids and so forth. There was some, some treatment, but by and large, it was a very, very contaminated environment. The other thing that's important to, to recognize from this period, and it's interesting to contemplate today, uh, if, you were to, if you were to take a position like the spectator did, uh, recall in the 1860s, the editorial writers of the spectator thought that the problem was a difficult one. Like, how are we going to address the fact that we don't want to stifle this growing little city of ours, but at the same time, all food is local in the 1860s, so we can't mess around with the fishery. So what are we going to do about this? Um, that point of view, um, that set of priority, competing priorities, was gone 100 years later when the paper said that the cesspool of the bay was part of Hamilton's growth and prosperity. Let's have an end to the nonsense about how tragic it was that the bay ever got that way. It got that way because Hamilton was, and is, despite the hand ringers, a great industrial city. Write that letter to the editor today and tell me how popular you are. <laughs> so, here in Hamilton, as across the Great Lakes, there were a number, there were a number, there were a countless number of people uh, working in Cleveland and in Hamilton and in other places to change that perspective, that to change the view illustrated by the Spectator's editorial that somehow we had to give up the idea of having both a healthy environment and a healthy economy in order to have jobs and incomes and so forth. Um, here in Hamilton, there were numerous people involved, uh, but we tend to we tend to highlight one person in particular, the heroine of this story, this is Jill Simmons, who lived on Bay Street North, and this is uh, this is her in in standing, looking probably longingly at the bay through a chain link fence, because as that process was taking place, if you recall the bay, the amount of infill in the bay, as that process was taking place and larger and larger ships were coming in from the, from the lake, bigger and bigger piles of, of uh, industrial material, waste and raw materials and so forth were being piled next to the bay and, and, and washed away. That chain link fence ran from east to west. And so we not only contaminated our local environment, we not only cut ourselves off physically, but I think also psychologically as a community, that chain link fence served to sever us from the water that we'd enjoyed for, and had this great relationship with for generations going back, of course, of course, many centuries. Um, 
This is uh, Jill, uh, late in life, looking, I don't know, contemplative, maybe satisfied somewhat with uh, Bayfront Park in the background. We'll get to Bayfront in a second. The concern that, that she and her neighbors er, in the early 1970s became most concerned with, or acutely concerned with, was the lax property. So what you see here, uh, this is the this is a Bay Street crossing the, the rail yard here, and if you take a, a left and go down the hill into Bayfront Park's parking lot down here today, this over here, Bay Street is here crossing the rail yard, and then today you can take a left and come down into Bayfront Park to the parking lot right here. This started out as um, everything that was blasted from the escarpment to create the Claremont access ended up here. Um, along with who knows what. There was never any money uh, available to catalog what was there. But uh, this property was filled from the late 1980s, sorry, to the, from the late 1960s into the mid 1980s. Um, here's another shot of that property right here, extending out into the water. That's um, Bay Street right there. So there's the beginnings of what we've become, Bayfront Park with Bay Street right there, and Jill lived along here, and the kitchen window of her house, she and her neighbors looked out at this activity in the, in the early 1970s, um, is what spurred that initial citizen action. Today, of course, this is what we know it as. Um, it's a thing of beauty, um, a sow's ear from, a, sorry, a silk purse from a sow's ear was invented, I think, to describe Bayfront Park. And it really is, I think for me, a great, symbol of what, of the, of the basic tension of ecological restoration in trying to decide as a, as a community when enough is enough and what to do about it and who's going to be responsible and then when are we going to be satisfied, generally speaking, collectively, when will we, we be satisfied. So if you consider for a moment these two pictures illustrating two very different moments in the, in the life of the Bay and its community and think to yourself, well, if one isn't attainable and one isn't acceptable, what are we going to do about it? Who's going to do the, the heavy lifting? Who's going to pay for it? And how are we going to agree when we've done enough? So if we can skip to the late 1980s and 1991, when the Remedial Action Plan had been meeting, uh, sorry, uh, creating a forum, uh, a venue for interested parties from across the community, citizens, organizations, companies, private <coughs> interests, community groups, um, public agencies, to all get together and talk about that central tension about what are we going to do. We all agree now at this point that this is no longer acceptable in Hamilton or Cleveland or Thunder Bay or wherever. Um, and what are we going to do about it? And in Hamilton, we had the good fortune of Jill Simmons and a number of her friends formed something called the Bay Area Restoration Council, rather than what happened in many places where a public advisory committee was struck by the governments to advise the governments on actions to take. Many of those citizens in the, in the early 1990s said, you know what, as this process evolves and starts to be implemented, this plan starts to take place, we want something separate from the government, a partner agency to inspire, to handhold, to celebrate, to cajole, uh, to encourage, and otherwise engage our fellow citizens, um, which continues, thankfully, to be my job like this evening. So we do things like this. We engage our fellow citizens, this is one of my favorite little guys, um, in programs in the community, uh, programs in schools, our uh, Creeks and Creepy Crawlies program, which uh, if you've ever gotten kids in grade three in white lab coats, it's, it's fun. Um, our, uh, our programs that put the, f the painted fish on fences, they may be on a school in your neighborhood, uh, and other programs reach between 10 and 12,000 uh, elementary and middle school students every year, and we're very proud of that. Um, we also, with the help of our friends at the Royal Botanical Gardens, get volunteers out into the marsh 
uh, like these, uh, this youth group from Burlington last summer, doing the, the hard but very fun and rewarding work of, uh, of reestablishing Coots Paradise. One thing that we do, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about tonight, is every five years produce a report card trying to explain to the community how exactly things are going. And I've done a little bit of extra work tonight to try and set up the idea that it took us, first of all, a very long time to wreck the place. And that for a very long time, people have actually, they've had the same concerns that we do about the economy and not giving something up for the sake of something else, but yet trying to wrestle with the idea that it's all important and what do we do about that. That this is, this goes back many generations in this community. And so it's not something necessarily that we should, it's not something to give up on quickly. Um, it's something to continue because we can actually see progress as much as we can see uh, the work that needs to be done. So. The, uh, the report card did three things in 2017. It gave a grade to healthy water and habitat, for example. And you might think to yourself, C+. Plus. If you're like my daughter in grade 9 who takes her studies very seriously, she, she was mortified. C plus is terrible. But C plus, obviously, first of all, let's acknowledge that it's not a failing grade. And of course, of course, we go back a few decades ago, we were failing miserably. I'm not even sure we showed up for the final exam. <laughs> so let me just talk for a second about, about C+. So what, what we do at BARC, as a, I like to think that we are a broker, an honest broker of information. So we gather together dozens of our colleagues from across the remedial action plan, either in governmental agencies or private, com private business interests, uh, scientists from McMaster and, and others, um, to talk about the, their assessment of where we're at, to measure it against the objectives of the Remedial Action Plan. And the plan says that for 15, 14 different categories, for each of those polluted areas across the Great Lakes, for 14 different categories like fish and wildlife habitat and populations and water quality, toxics uh, in the water and in the sediment in the bottom, there's an objective that we have to meet, to meet. We have to improve water quality to a certain degree. We have to bring the fish community back to a certain degree. We have to have enough habitat to support those things. We have to have the quality of water in order for everything to thrive, and so on and so on. We have to be able to swim at the beach, for example, at the beaches. Uh, and so the Remedial Action Plan for Hamilton Harbor has objectives that we have to meet. And all of the work that gets done, like. Randall Reef, for example, is a project that many people in the community are very familiar with, or have certainly heard a lot about. We, uh, we, um, we work towards those objectives. So this is an assessment of several dozens, several dozen of the people most intimately involved in those projects, researching or implementing on where exactly we are after all of these years towards reaching those end goals. And so it's nice to contrast uh, this inlet here in the back of Coots Paradise, some of the best water, which if we go back, say, 50 or 60 years to when we were literally called a stinking rotten quagmire of filth and poisonous waste, you can see that without question, we've made many, many advances, despite the fact that we haven't checked any of those boxes next to the final objectives that we're working towards. We've gotten close, uh, we're getting close in some, degree, in some degree, and we're still doing the background research to figure out how well we're doing in some other categories. Um, one of the big ones is to do with how much phosphorus is in the water in the harbor. Phosphorus occurs naturally. If it wasn't in lakes and rivers, uh, you wouldn't have healthy ecosystems. It's a necessary thing uh, to life, but too much of it uh, can choke out uh, that life. It leads to blooms of algae, which when, that, um, when those organisms die and begin to decay, they suck all the oxygen out of the water, taking it away from the fish and other critters that need it. If we go back to the, to the 1970s and before that, when I described how much sewage was being uh, released into the harbor, the levels of phosphorus were uh, astronomical through the roof. 
And so it's not surprising that that initial 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that put tr uh, billions of dollars in the U.S. and Canada into wastewater treatment, uh, it's not surprising that when re you remove a lot of sewage from the water, things get better. And so that's that first arrow. The second arrow, through the, the decades that follow, cut the amount of phosphorus in the harbor in half again. And each one of those dots, as we go down the chart, over time represents an enormous, an enormous achievement of technology, of scientific insight and hard work in the community to demand that people in charge of spending money spend it here uh, and not put it into the business of one of the many, many, many baby birds in the nest that are all that all want something, right? Um, the dotted line. The dotted line to 2020 and some point in the future, um, the dotted line represents cutting the amount of phosphorus in the harbor in half again. That's the thing we still have to do. And as you could probably have lots of examples in your own lives of where you know you've, you've worked to get nine tenths of the way, picked all the low hanging fruit, whatever you want to call it, it's that stuff way up high that we're trying to pick now uh, that's proving to be really difficult. The stars represent the three wastewater treatment plants in uh, around Hamilton Harbor that treat about half of the water that eventually ends up back in the bay. About half of the water going into the bay goes through one of the three wastewater treatment plants. In the back of Coots Paradise in Dundas, the Woodward plant in East Hamilton, and Burlington Halton's Skyway plant just on the side of the QEW. Uh, the Skyway plant has undergone an enormous uh, uh, rebuild to incorporate as much of the latest technology uh, to reduce phosphorus and do a number of other things before that the sewage that comes into the plant is released as clean water back into the bay. The Woodward plant is now just getting underway. It has several uh, years and many tens of millions of dollars uh, to go before those are completed. Uh, but when that happens, the vast majority of the sewage that gets treated and, the, and that water returned to the harbor will go through one of the best, two of the best uh, wastewater treatment plants in North America. And if you've been reading the paper diligently, you may have picked up on the fact that the city of Hamilton is now discussing, along with partner agencies in the remedial action plan, upgrades to the, to the Dundas plant to try and improve water quality flowing through Coots Paradise Marsh. The other 50% of the water that enters the harbor, uh, not through a wastewater treatment plant, but it comes overland into creeks and into the harbor through one of the major, three major rivers or the others, the Spencer Creek through Dundas, the Red Hill Valley, sorry, the Red Hill Creek through the valley in the east end, and grindstone coming down through water down into, uh, into the bay. So there's a couple of things that happen as water travels across a, a, a developed landscape. So if you imagine yourself a, a droplet of water falling from the sky on a forest, say the forest that where downtown is today, you'd fall on a leaf and you'd sit there and then you'd fall on another leaf and you'd eventually make your way down to the forest floor where it was soft and you probably pooled and puddled and then slowly uh, infiltrated into the ground, and most of the water that's actually feeding the streams historically would be through the ground and not over land. The opposite of tr is true when we cover the landscape and farm fields and parking lots. The water comes down quickly, not hitting any leaf, not being pooled or puddled in any way, and is rocketed across the hard, impervious surfaces that we've created, like roads and parking lots, picking up oil and dirt and so forth and transferring it to surface water very quickly. There's a couple of problems with that. One is that it causes erosion, and so it's a threat to private property, it's a threat to water quality because eroding water is picking up a lot of phosphorus, which likes to stick to the little bits of sand that's picked up as the river um, rushes it away, and it ends up down in the, in the bay. This is a graph. Uh, from data collected by the Ministry, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, several years ago, 
showing the impact on water quality from a storm event. So you can see on the left the pre-storm at base flow, so the river is running relatively clean. The storm begins and the system as a whole, so the river and its downstream environment is hit very quickly. You can see those first two, three, four hours become very dark very quickly. The issue is that it's predicted under climate change models that we will have more intense storm events. So all of the hard work by our, our youth group from Burlington and the Marsh and the RBG staff and others uh, at agencies and community groups across, uh, across Hamilton and around the Bay, all of that work can be undone 362 days a year by two or three events that overwhelm the system with contaminants and a flood of, of uh, phosphorus and, and others. Um, another issue uh, in the background to that C plus, something dragging down uh, the grade somewhat, is the goal to be able to swim at our two, what I should underline as artificial beaches in the harbor, Bayfront and Pier 4. Uh, most of the contamination there is from wildlife, and unfortunately, most of the contamination on any given day is across the entire harbor. Most of that bacterial contamination is right at the ankle level of, uh, of, a, of a kid swimming at the beach. Um, in 2016, Bark and our friends at RBG did some sampling across the harbor. Uh, we went out one morning and collected a couple dozen uh, samples. The green samples illustrate uh, water quality that meets the provincial standard for recreational use. So you can go swimming at any one of the green dots. Insofar as bacteria is concerned, that's a safe place to swim. The red dots indicate uh, levels of bacteria in those samples above the, um, the provincial standard. And unfortunately, you can see that half of them are in the West Harbor, where I've circled in yellow the recreational area that we're trying to promote people re-engaging with the bay. That's where the beach at the foot of Bay Street was in the 1920s. There's still a beach at the foot of Bay Street today, and we would like people to be able to re-engage with the harbor safely. Um, there's a dot you can see on the North Shore, um, just off of uh, Aldershot in the cemetery there. Um, there's a community up there, and we suspect that that's probably overland flow through a culvert into the bay directly. And then the dot at the very top of the map is the mouth of Indian Creek, which has the misfortune of running right along the QEW and the parking lot to Mapleview Mall. And uh, it's a bit of an urban disaster coming out of there. And the, the water literally um, <coughs> changed from one color to a very distinctive different color literally a line right there that we crossed. So we took two samples. Um, we took the green one and then 20 feet later we took the red one and it was completely off the charts. So what we are trying to do is begin to have a conversation about not only making it appealing for people to go back near the water, to buy a condo at Pier 8, to have a coffee at Williams, to take a bike ride along the waterfront trail, but actually go in the water again. And a lot of probably nine-tenths of that work is going to all be in our heads, convincing people that it's no longer a uniformly dangerous place, that many of the problems that we have now are localized. Um, we still have some, some pretty significant problems to overcome, but I will just say that if you're going to suggest such a thing, you're going to get the question, and the answer has to be yes. Come on, Sonny. Just skip back quickly on the, on the issue of uh, healthy water and habitat. So this is Coots Paradise um, about 25, 30 years ago. Water quality, very poor. But I want to talk about habitat in particular and the way in which we are slowly bringing back the bay, uh, much like those early industrialists would have looked at their wooden wharfs and their small boats and, and couldn't even imagine the lakers that come in with, with massive loads of agricultural products, and steel and, and other industrial products, they could not even imagine 
the industrialization of the South Shore today. If we go back to those 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 captains of industry early in, in the in the uh, in the 1800s. So consider this. Uh, look for a second through the middle of the large red uh, the large red area that channel. That's the historic Dunda Desjardins Canal, and then to the right of it is the back end of Coots, uh, the important wildlife. Uh, it's a protected area for wildlife. So let's skip ahead to a more very recent uh, photograph. You can see on the left the, de the historical Desjardins Canal that Dundas cut through to the bay when it was small, like Hamilton, trying to compete with Hamilton before the railroad. But you can also see, and this is exceptionally exciting, the reestablishment of Spencer Creek through the marsh. And it's only through decades of hard work, one little cattail planting at a time, that this kind of work, uh, that this kind of outcome takes place. And it, it just so happens that it's, it's way back from the highway, and the vast majority of people have no idea that, that this kind of progress has been made, and that Coots Paradise uh, today, at least in June and July, looks like this, and that there are groups that you could even join out doing work like this. So in the foreground here is a planting that we did, uh, I think this is the previous summer, and then you can see stands of cattails in the background from the previous summer and from previous years that are thriving. And so we still, though, to take a, a balanced view of this, the C plus um, view of this, we still have um, issues with sewage, for example, that do, uh, that do undermine our ability to improve water quality. So here's a syringe. You're thinking, how did this needle get onto the shores? So that's something, people flush the strangest things down the toilet. This, uh, so this needle's gone down through it, gone down through, uh, uh, been flushed in the toilet, down through the pipe. Uh, it's during a storm event, so in one of the old pipes that's combined under the, street, under the old city streets, uh, rainwater from the streets going down into that pipe along with the toilets that are being flushed, because we don't stop using the toilet when it's raining. And uh, although we should maybe make that a rule, um, it would be helpful. So when the system gets overwhelmed by a really big rain event, um, it either comes back into our basements or it's jettisoned out into the environment. And that's what it looks like. All manner of stuff is out there. Bacteria, stuff you can't see, but then stuff that you can see. All right, let's quickly skip through uh, some fish and wildlife. Again, C+, plus because there are some great news stories, and then there are some lingering problems that that are, uh, that are continuing to frustrate, frustrate us from a scientific standpoint. Um, can I get uh, hands for anybody that's here tonight because they read about it in the paper? Awesome. So if you were reading the paper today, you would have seen this photograph. Um, this is a great friend of, uh, of Bart, Van Godfrey, member of the community. Um, and uh, he caught this in January. It's a walleye. It's a native. Uh, predator species that's being reintroduced in the last several years by the Ministry of the Environment. And uh, this fish, it's a good chance this fish started out about this big in the harbor, um, being shot out of, a, out of a truck with 50 other little, 50,000 other little fish about this big. And uh, so that's, an, that's a magnificent creature, look at that thing. So I show this in part that people are, you want, you, that's, in the harbor? I didn't think anything lived in the harbor. Um, but if, yes, in fact, lots of stuff lives in the harbor. Unfortunately, that lots of stuff includes species like goldfish, which don't belong in the harbor. They're introduced from other places for lots of different reasons. But the important thing to, to note, I think, for those who don't think that anything lives in the harbor is that these are all species of fish that live in the harbor. The green ones are native species. They were here before Mrs. Simcoe's uh, paintings, and the red ones have been introduced from somewhere else. The problem is the ones introduced from somewhere else, they often don't have predators here that eat them in large numbers. They're often very tolerant of the polluted conditions here, and so they can thrive when the native ones are not doing very well. The problem also is that they, then therefore they expand in number, they eat the resources, the limited amount of stuff that's available for everything, all of the green ones to eat, therefore limit, further limiting the conditions for the green ones. The historical 
problems of pollution in the harbor too manifest themselves in uh, deformities and uh, and, content and, uh, and, um, and health issues with species like this. But I think the important there's a couple important things uh, to recognize. One is that um, this is from the Ontario the Ontario government's fish consumption guidelines, which they publish for everybody, almost every body of water across the province every year. And so I'll draw your attention to the green, for example. So Hamilton Harbor is on the left. Jordan Harbor down the, uh, down the lake is on the right. If you were so inclined to consume common carp, you can see that you could eat a lot of them out of Jordan Harbor, especially if they are young. So moving across from left to right is the, uh, the sizes and sort of the ages of the fish. And common, car common carp are down in the sediment they're rooting around for stuff, and that's where you're going to find the, the legacy contamination, the stuff that still exists. Um, smallmouth bass I've also highlighted again, and I think that not only are the, yes, of course, the, the numbers are smaller, but the fact is that they are not zero. You may not be inclined to eat fish out of the harbor, but risk assessment models suggest that you could do so on a very limited basis. Um, it is not. Again, that uniformly dangerous place that we've come to believe over many generations. Um, as for fish and wildlife, um, frogs, turtles are not included in the assessment of how well the fish and wildlife are doing. Uh, there are six species of colonial water birds that are included. All of them are doing relatively well at the moment. There's, it's one of the the, uh, the star objectives right now in the remedial action plan. Uh, it's assumed from the beginning that populations of, of frogs and turtles, for example, will recover when their habitat is restored and water quality is improved. So they're not something that's measured. Um, and then, of course, one of the terrific uh, reasons to celebrate the recovery of Hamilton Harbor and its watershed is that uh, eagles have returned in Lake Ontario for the first time in 60 years, and they uh, they decided to pick Hamilton, kind of like my wife and I did. And the last of the three things that we measure, toxic contaminants and sediment, um, we were really bad at this one up until a couple of years ago when the green light was given to the Randall Reef project. Randall Reef is an area of the harbor right down here, the red arrow illustrated here um, in this photograph of the Stelco property. So right down where the Stelco property meets Pier 15, which is um, down in here. So here's, I think that's a shadow from a cloud or something, but that's Randall Reef also down in, down in here. It's, a, it's an area where 150 years of legacy pollution has settled and the good news, I suppose, is that it's, uh, it's not a uniformly toxic environment. We have these localized problems now to deal with. And uh, this is a map of that corner of the harbor showing the levels of toxicity of the, of the residue left over um, from industrial processes, steel making and, and uh, mining and, and so forth. Lots of different things that have gone, over, gone, gone um, on over the course of 150 years. And so what the project entails is building a steel box around much of that red area and then dredging the remainder and putting it into the box and capping it, thereby separating that material from the rest of, of the environment. Um, it's taken a long time to get this project underway. Funding announcements were made and then another funding announcement was made, but nothing actually got built for many, many years. Um, much to the consternation of the average person like you and I who were looking at this thinking, okay, like, let's get going. What are we waiting for? Part of the problem was the fact that there is enough material down there to fill what we used to call Cops Coliseum three times. It's a phenomenal uh, amount of material and a very, very sophisticated project. It costs this much money. These are the partners from the Remedial Action Plan that have put the money uh, into this project. Um, it's a miracle this thing is being built, I think, uh, in part because the Hamilton Port Authority is not exactly a wealthy organization. Um, 
they have a lot of economic activity, but they really are kind of a razor thin bottom line, and yet they maintained their $14 million uh, contribution. U.S. Steel Canada, uh, now, now being called Stealth Hill again, but the fact that Pittsburgh bought out the operations in Hamilton with $7 million liability on the books, and they doubled that to $14 million, the fact that it ever, that that ever stayed on the books uh, down in Pittsburgh is remarkable. The fact that the, that the, the Harbor government maintained that pledge uh, for all those years while the other partners got their act together, that's remarkable. And by the end of 2016, this is what the project looked like, so half of that steel box had been built. Just to give you a little idea of what we're talking about, you can see these guys, these guys down here, this is remarkable. Some of these steel piles are more than 100 feet long, they're being driven down and then they're coupled, sort of like holding your fingers together like that, until they completely encase that. Uh, this is towards the end of August 2017, so just this past summer, the steel box walls were completed. And so all of that material that's down at the bottom, some of that worst in that red zone now, is separated from the environment. And beginning next year, uh, they bring a big Hoover vacuum out into the harbor and start sucking up all that material from the bottom. They'll be monitoring air quality and water quality. And, um, and then two or three years later, they begin to build the, the, the cap on top of that uh, structure it will be turned over from the federal government to the Port Authority and they will use it for economic activity. Money they make from those activities will be used to maintain the box. That's the deal. Um, there's a couple other things that I would mention from our report card that you can get at hamiltonharbor.ca slash report card. Um, we also looked at some other really important activities that go on in, in the harbor in the, along with the remedial action plan. Research and monitoring, watershed management, trying to figure out how to not contaminate that other 50% of the water that flows off the landscape, and public information, education, and access. Access, public access. If you think about that chain link fence, and if you grew up in Hamilton in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, how many times it ever occurred to you to go down to the bay, which I know people who are 50 or up in Hampton, and they would think, like, never. Um, the vestiges of, of that relationship from the, between the community and, and the bay uh, outstrip any of the actual gains that we make, that perceptions aren't keeping up with reality. Um, so in terms of research and monitoring, if you read the article in the paper today, you read Christine Boston. Um, she was quoted, this is Christine and one of her friends out in the harbor. Um, problems with flooding, and you can see the impacts that that has on water quality in streams and creeks. And then, of course, public information and education programs like, like ours that put ideas in, in, the, in the minds of children and they take them home and hopefully educate, uh, educate their, their elders about the importance of changing our behaviors. Um, opportunities for young people in the community to become engaged, to be ambassadors. Hopefully the, that you will take some of these messages home and over the back fence uh, talk to your neighbors about some of these important issues. You should so happen to find yourself down at City Hall one day, you'll be armed with a lot of information and enthusiasm. Um, this is one of the people who participated in our leadership program last year and we like to encourage people to of course get out and explore the Bay and its environments themselves. This is one of my favorite photos of all time. Um, the, the, my personal slogan for this photo is, this is my handlock. This is Hamilton, just as much as anything else. Thanks so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Very much.